Okay, we're back. It's uh, 4 o'clock. Well, roughly oh, 4 o'clock <laughs> here on Hawaii, the state of clean energy, our flagship energy program on Wednesday afternoon. And, of course, we are joined by Sharon Moriwaki, my co-host and the co-chair of the Hawaii Energy Policy Forum. Aloha. Hi, Sharon. Hello. You ready for a good show? Great show. We have Ted here. We have Ted here. Oh, Ted who? Ted. Ted Peck. <laughs> we know Ted Peck for a long time. Say hello, Ted. Hello, Ted. <laughs> <laughs> and we are joined also by uh, Chris Swartley uh, from Progression Energy. He's a, C uh, he's a founding partner there uh, on, by Skype. Say hello to Chris. Hello, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> you guys must be related. I, I, needed, to, I needed to follow Ted on that one. And today we're going to talk about wind, wind on the waves in Hawaii. Ne. All right. So um, I'm not sure exactly what the scope of our discussion is going to be. I'm going to leave it to Ted, Ted Peck of uh, Holu Energy to tell us what the scope of this discussion about wind is going to be today. Well, um, I think, well, first of all, Chris and I have been working together for the last almost five years on this project. Uh, we want to talk a little bit about the project, talk a little bit about the technology, a little bit of why uh, if we are serious about our 100% clean energy target, um, we will end up in a project like this simply because um, this is the resource that, that uh, is the cheapest and available. Um, and then uh, talk a little bit about the process and where we are in the process and mm -hmm. how we're driving. Chris, did you yeah. think that that works? Sure, yeah. yeah. Talk a little history talk where we are now, well, let's talk, talk, about, talk history. about what kind of value this has for Hawaii. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's really important. Good, good discussion. Important that we cover those points. Uh, let's talk about history first. I remember First Wind uh, did an initial uh, installation on the, on the top of the mountains there in uh, West Maui. Very successful. The community liked it. Sharon and I went up there. We mm -hmm. saw the devices they had to, to save the birds and all that. Remember that? Um, and right. we talked to Kekoa. The Nene's. Uh, Kalu Hiva. Now Deputy Director. Deputy, yeah, now, yeah, now yeah. Deputy DLNR. Um, and we learned about wind, and we were very impressed with the way that First Wind set that up. But that's a long time ago, and, you know, it seems to me that all the focus um, in the interim has been on, on solar. And I personally like wind. I consider wind kind of a, a music of the soul if you will. Well, I think it's important, and I, when I was the energy administrator, I would get frustrated by this when um, the proponents of the different renewable resources would beat on each other and say that they were better. Actually, wind and solar are very complementary. You know, wind comes through the whole 24-hour cycle, but it's especially strong uh, in, in the darkness. And of course, as we know, solar is during the solar day. Um, so they're just very complementary resources. Yeah, yeah. Why haven't they been, been as popular, occupied the front page as much as solar? Yeah, and that uh, actually Chris was one of the, I think what you were uh, employee number six at uh, First Win when it was, was UPC I Win. I think you could just say I'm the found, I was, I was part of the founding team. Founder of the founding Win. team. Okay, right? all right. So Back he's been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Chris has been in Win for a long time and um, we started doing this project uh, in, when Chris and I had, were with different companies actually about f five years ago. Uh, and we really started very low key uh, and started by doing, I don't want to call it a listening tour, but really going into members of the community and saying, hey, here's what we're thinking. Well, you know, what do you think? So what, so what do you, what, how do you feel public opinion is going right now on the subject? I mean, there was a, there was a lot of um, you know, resistance on the birds uh, and on the sound, right? Um, I don't think either one of them were a legitimate uh, opposition, but that but you heard noise about that. Well, you hear that the, noise over, now. I would say over the past um, five years that we've been talking with a range of stakeholders, um, I think that you know people have brought up um, real legitimate concerns, fishing birds, um, visuals, and we've been addressing those with folks. But you know we've now had about 150 meetings over the past five years. Mm -hmm. uh, we and and I think. You know, even though there are legitimate concerns, we feel like there's a, an important amount of support 
for this project because of what it does offer and also because you know as a as a data point we started out with five sites and after doing about 120 meetings we narrowed that down to one site because that was the site with the most support and it was only when we had done a significant amount of stakeholder engagement did we even put a lease into the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and so you know while there are you know genuine concerns that we need to address throughout the permitting process um, I, I feel like we really started this project in the right way by listening and having that uh, having that stakeholder feedback guide our sighting. So Chris of those concerns what have you addressed um, you know, what, what specifically were they concerned about and how have you overcome them or somehow worked past that or are you still working on it? Well, one, one big concern was visuals. Um, and so we've cited our project. It's about 14 miles southwest of Honolulu. Um, you know, most of the project will be over the horizon. Um, you know, there will be, from the preliminary visual simulations we've done, you know, you will be able to see some of the project, but it'll, it, you know, it'll be pretty small. You really have to look for it, you know, beyond the sailboats, um, you know, beyond the oil tankers, beyond the, the uh, be, beyond the paragliders. Right. You, you, you might mistake these, these turbine, these wind floats for a sailboat. You won't mistake them for an oil tanker. And this project actually alone will probably eliminate about four oil tankers a year. Well, uh, why don't you, uh, Chris, why don't you talk about your project? Well, exactly uh, how, many, uh, how many turbines? Uh, what do you expect to output? What, what's, the, what's the project? Well, we're looking at 40 to 50 turbines, and some of that is driven by uh, what the size of the turbine, the offshore turbine, will be. We're, we're planning on a fourth quarter 2020 construction start date. Right now you can buy an eight megawatt turbine, offshore wind turbine, um, and we're looking at a 400 megawatt pro project. So that would be 50 units. Um, you know, if, if by that time it's a 10 megawatt turbine, that would be 40 units. Um, and we would be able to produce about a quarter of a watt who's electricity. Um, we'd be able to do it at a price that is comparative to solar. Um, but then the other, the other piece is, and, and, and what Ted mentioned before, is the good complement that wind and solar make for each other. Um, you know, wind can produce at night. It has, it has slow ramping up and down. It's, it's, it's grid friendly for an intermittent resource. So there are those values as well. So, so um, the other thing is, is that, you know, the one last thing that's, that I think is really critical is that Oahu just doesn't have the land to meet its energy needs mm. and while the ocean is a very important resource and we're working hard with folks to make sure to minimize any impacts on the ocean um, we actually only use about five acres of land on on Oahu for interconnection facilities some some questions about it um, you know we, we've talked about uh, you know the siting issue and uh, we talked about uh, the birds and uh, all that but what about the ocean traffic you know what about the shipping lanes? What about small boats, fishermen, what have you, uh, 14 miles south of Honolulu? Are there issues? Has anybody expressed concern about that? One of the first things we looked at was commercial shipping traffic. And, and uh, what's nice is that's, that's widely available on the web on, uh, on, on GIS data platforms. Um, so we chose an area that had low commercial traffic. The next is, is fishing, and we've been working with various uh, members of the fishing communities um, in Oahu now for about three or four years and you know they have very very legitimate questions you know can we fish in and among the the wind floats you know are there any things we need to watch out about and that's you know that's that's part of the many conversations that we have with them. Mm -hmm. well, uh, what about um, what about connectivity you know there you are out there I guess the the devices these days they are they planted uh, with you know, with with um, on the on the ocean bottom, they're, they're or they or they these are vessels and they float. They're vessels that float. They have like three or four just drag anchors, so it's just like uh, they stay in the pretty much. Of the, yeah. So how the question I have is how do you deliver the energy these turbines are generating back to shore, and what's the uh, what's the landing point like, and all there's, that? Um, Give me a handle on that. From a, there's going to be two transmission lines, AAC transmission lines, that will come, um, you know, under 
the reef area and they'll come after a short distance and connect to uh, available substations. So it's a, uh, it's a pretty low impact and pretty short distance. How do you get under the reef without damaging the reef? Horizontal drilling. That's, that is very mature technology. Mm. Uh, you know, the, the uh, data cables that are being placed under this island now, actually, there's one that just had an EIS completed and that's that's what they're going to do. They just horizontal drill. It's it is very mature technology. Doing so this that. is just it's an undersea cable, using slant drilling. Well, I wasn't going to use that word. <laughs> I, I know we we've heard that word before. You know. <laughs> it is very low impact environmentally. Very low yeah, okay, impact environmentally. Okay. So how large how large is because when we talk history when we saw those those turbines they're huge uh, in Maui. So are they that big? And if the, the wave comes, will they The nacelles are like four hundred feet above the ocean, the tip of the blade's about another 200 feet, 100, 170, 200 feet above and it. So they are larger. And is that stable enough, like when the wind and the wa waves come and go? You know, so uh, the technology that we're uh, planning to deploy is called uh, wind float. Um, Can by I straighten one power. thing out, Ted? Yes, sir. <clears throat> You're two different projects, two different companies. Is that right? Or are you That's collaborating on the same project? Yeah, yeah, the same project. Ah, okay, okay. So yeah, it's a yeah, joint venture to, between your respective companies? Yeah, is that well, the, uh, pro progression's in the lead. We're under contract in an interest Okay, system. working together. Yeah, okay, absolutely. good. All right, good. Wow. Well, One I'm glad project. we got that straight out. <laughs> okay, I thought we were I actually told you we had two projects with two no, sets but, of turbines. But you have two, two projects, right? I mean, two there, there's, another, there's another gentleman who's developing another uh, project similar. in the same... Um, Offshore. Yeah, he's doing a... Oh. yeah. Okay. okay, sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. No, no so the, 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 pr the principal power wind float uh, has been operating off the coast of Portugal for about five years. How far? Uh, it's about five kilometers offshore. It's closer than this one. It is, about three, one third of the distance. Mm. And, uh, and if you look, if you go, uh, you can Google, there's a video about it, and it's hard to see, actually. Uh, and it's, it's about. Ten miles. Remember uh, what was the gentleman's name? Um, Marshall. Is that right, Chris? The guy that surfed the hundred-foot wave off Portugal. That's about ten miles away. And so that wind float has been through three fifty-year storms in the time that it's been in place, which is always funny to say. Yeah, well, I do years. want to ask you about that. I mean, and, imagine, and, you know, climate change. Imagine you know, sea level. Imagine. Violent storms. Uh, how confident are you that you'll be able to beat those storms? At, at very confident. This this technology is ridden through some very high seas, um, very tumultuous storms, and not only did it ride through without any mechanical problems, but the production was though it was on land. So it is a very mature. It's actually uh, a marriage of two decades-old technologies. Offshore wind, you know, there's um, gigawatts of offshore wind, of bottom-mounted offshore wind off northern Europe. So that's not new technology. Oh, yeah, that's been there for a long time. Yeah, and then the, and then, and then the, the semi-submersible is uh, it's the same like the X-band radar. It's the same technology. It's from the oil and gas industry. It's been in use for years. So what Principal Power has done is marry those two in a very robust way. And when we come back from this break, we're going to find out exactly where we are in the timeline, what has to happen. And uh, gee, I'm very, uh, I'm very excited about this. You know, I, I feel that wind has got a poetry to it, and, um, and I like wind on the waves, so even I'm, more so. <laughs> I'm, I'm on your side for sure. So anyway, let's take a short break. Come back, and you can give us the practical fact of what's going to happen from this point forward. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii, meeting people we may not have otherwise met, helping us understand and appreciate the good things about Hawaii. Great content for Hawaii from Think Tech. Aloha, Howard Wig. I am the proud host of Code Green Think Tech Hawaii. I appear every other Monday at 3 in the afternoon. Do not tune in in the morning. My topic is energy efficiency. It sounds dry as heck, but it's not. We're paying $5 billion a year for imported oil. My job is to shave that, shave that, shave that down in homes and buildings while delivering better comfort, better light, better air conditioning, better everything. So if you're interested in your future, you'd better tune in to me. Three o'clock every other Monday, code green, aloha, and thank you. 
very much. To get to okay, we're back. Now. We're live yeah. with uh, Ted Peck and uh, Chris Swatley. And uh, they're, uh, Chris is with um, Progression Energy and Ted is with uh, Holu. And they are collaborating in a big project uh, off the uh, southern coast of Oahu, 14 miles out for wind, day and night. Huh? It always is day and night, isn't it? It is. Uh, okay. And so we're going to get a handle on where you are now in the timeline, what has happened, what needs to happen. How are you going to complete this project by 2020? Is that what you said, Chris? 2020? Yeah, actually, start construction in 2020. Start construction. Construction is the easiest part, am I right? <laughs> <laughs> I think you're right. <laughs> um, yeah, we've been at this project for about five years. It's been a lot of stakeholder engagement. Um, we put in a lease application to Bureau of Ocean Energy Management uh, last October. Uh, it's in federal waters, so and the, the the agency that oversees federal waters is uh, is BOEM, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. Yeah, so it's outside um, the 12 mile uh, limit. Yeah. So, uh, um, how much jurisdiction does the state have out there at 14 miles? Go ahead, Chris. So, sorry, can you repeat the question? How much jurisdiction does the state have out there 14 miles? Well, we have, we'll be in federal, state, and local jurisdictions because our, our pro the, the wind floats will be in federal waters. Um, our cables will be going through the coastal management zone, so that'll be the NLR. And then we'll, on landfall, we'll be in the city and county of Honolulu. So, um, so we'll be working with regulators uh, from federal, state, and local. And generally, uh, generally the, the, the regulators you know, know how to align their various processes so that we can, you know, that there will be a lead agency. Um, you know, the studies, the many studies that we do will be used for a number of permits at the federal, state, and, and local level. But that's the, you know, really that's the main thing that will be happening over the next three to four years is, um, you know, once we achieve a, a lease with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, we'll be spending three to four years of permitting. Um, the other big piece is selling the energy to Hawaiian Electric Company, and we've been in discussion with them for the past couple of years, and those discussions continue. Um, they're generally positive, um, you know, and, and a lot of that is because we offer a, uh, you know, renewable energy at a competitive price, and it is uh, grid friendly for, a, for an intermittent resource. Well, I just, this does uh, raise the question of curtailment as we have seen uh, on the neighbor islands anyway, where the utility has said, okay, it's, uh, we don't need it right now, so we're gonna curtail you. Um, how can you get around that problem? Because if you've invested a fair amount of money in building these turbines and installing these turbines and, and the cable, um, and then you have to curtail, you're not making much of a return during the curtailment period. Uh, how, how are you gonna deal with that? Well, curtailment um, is a negotiated term uh, in, and in the in a renewable world at a hundred percent renewable there will be curtailment and in the future curtailment will offer opportunity for storage so um, we're just gonna we haven't really crossed that bridge um, when the OIT study was done the off uh, Oahu wind integration technical study back in 2009 uh, I believe uh, bringing in 400 megawatts of wind from Maui County had two to three percent curtailment, if I remember correctly, uh, associated with it. So that's that's it's a not yet that to much. Be determined. Yeah. It's not that much. Yeah, but I mean, I think your point uh, really is that if you if you have a battery system either on your side of the line or, or on the utility side of the line, curtailment's not a problem. Well, it's uh, cost. Fact, it's, it's, it's just a great a it's just management of cost, and you know what's the what's the uh, you know your loss of curtailed energy compared to your ability to store it and then deliver it at, at a different time. So, yeah. um, and that is, you know, we're in the beginning of the storage age. We're in a fairly mature place in, in solar. Um, storage is coming along. Uh, it's an exciting time. And I think that that's a, a TBD uh, to be determined. Yeah, did you see that, uh, that speech about uh, graphene? Um, <clears throat> that's pretty exciting, but I actually don't think we're going to have mature technology on graphene uh, in the next four years. I think that there are a lot, a, it, is a, it is an area filled with innovation. 
and the question is what's going to be commercialized what's going to be warn uh, you you're going to be able to warranty you know what are technologies you, you can warranty i we install technology we've i've just went through that nut roll of what does a warranty look like for storage on a 20-year ppa and it's not an insignificant process to kind of figure out so um that's we're just gonna as i said that's going to be an area for development yeah and i think as we get closer to implementation we get closer to understanding where we are and the utility feels a little more comfortable you know depending on which side of the meter it's going to be on we can we can sort that out yeah so i mean is it in terms of the timeline chris uh does this mean that you want to have your deal um negotiated and settled with the utility before you start construction i guess it does huh? <laughs> oh, yeah. otherwise you're really barking up a tree you know what i mean <laughs> or a windmill as the case may be yeah this isn't uh if we build it they will come you know that's not how that works this is a 1.8 billion dollar so so chris have, have project chris, chris have you um had any experience or know of any place else you know we're talking about a long process um anywhere else uh, that has done this and gone through the permitting and the, pro the whole process and how and which comes first, you know, chicken and egg kind of thing, but, you know, what kinds of things you have to put together for that to happen and happen more quickly than, you know, than not. Yeah, well, project financing is a pretty tried and true um, process. It's been going on for as long as capital markets have been around. And, and for, you know, for large infrastructure, of which renewable energy is a part, you know, you need a you need a credit worthy power purchase agreement. You need your permits in place. You need underwriters, and then the market does its very efficient, good job of bringing bringing debt and equity to a project. Um, so, and and as far as you know, as far as specifically floating offshore projects. Um, Principal Power, which is the uh, which is the owner of the Windflow technology, they have projects planned in Europe and Asia for 2017, 2018, 2019. So hope this project, you know, Hawaii will not be the first project for this. It may be the largest, but it won't be the first. There will be bank finance, project finance projects before that. But what about finance? I mean, how much money do you need to raise, and what what is the status of raising it? Um, well, it's really, you know, you know, having having been involved with project financing over the past 15 years, the the real challenge is getting through the permitting process. You know, negotiating a a PPA that you can then finance. Once you have all your paperwork in order, you know, it's it's really that's where you kind of get to the tried and true process, where the banks check all their boxes. Mm -hmm. You know, that you know, large commercial banks or even insurance companies. Um, you know, institutional equity providers, uh, um, you know, pension funds, things like that. They, you know, they really just need to check the box and then you, you know, it's usually a six to nine month process. But the, the, the real, you know, the real challenge is getting to that point. Yeah, how much, how much uh, do you think you'll have to raise? Um, well, the project's about $1.8 billion. So we're looking at, you know, probably 60 to 65% of that being debt and the, the balance being equity. And one of the things that I didn't understand when I was working for the state is, uh, which I learned when I went to that little venture, um, Kualkoa, is that there is tons of capital available on the sidelines looking for the right projects. Mm -hmm. So our job, and uh, our job working with the community, is to drive out as much risk as possible mm -hmm. so we get the lowest cost of capital possible so we can deliver the lowest price to the ratepayers. Mm, yeah. That's and so really this process that we're in now is all about driving out risk. So that and then once we drive out the risk and it's at the right time, and that money comes in at the right time, if you secure a larger amount of money early in the process, that's expensive money. The most expensive money is earliest in the project. The cheapest money is late in the project, and so you want to stage it so you get as much of the cheap money as possible and as little of the expensive money as possible. Yeah. And so that's the process that we're involved in now. So in, in, I, I know it's early to ask this, but uh, it's just But you're one, just going to go ahead and ask it. I'm going to ask it anyway. <laughs> Ted made me do this. <laughs> what, what, what's, is this the first increment among other increments? Is this the first project among other projects? 
I mean, should we, you think we should look forward to seeing a number of projects like this, uh, you know, going off the, the southern coast of Oahu? No, and I other, think, I think what, I would look, I, what I would look to is the PSIP process. You know, um, HECO uh, put a wedge of 800 megawatts in their PSIP, but that's not a done deal. It's not completed. So they're clearly thinking about offshore wind, whether it's, um, you know, sourced in the waters off of Oahu or sourced on another island. Uh, we believe this is the lowest cost opportunity. And as you know, I've kind of walked the dog talking about from Maui County you know, and once you get to those kind of distances, you take yourself out of AC connected and you move to DC connected with quarter million dollar, quarter billion dollar um, converter stations on either end of it. And so your costs start to go up significantly. What's the that. difference? I mean, what are the impacts of AC your versus losses, DC? Your losses. Once you, get, once you get past about somewhere in like 50 to 70 miles, your losses from AC connection uh, really becomes significant so that converting to DC is cost effective to do so it. So DC for, if for, any, for any significant length. Yes, okay. yes. Okay. So this is of a, such a short distance that AC makes sense. Well, very exciting project. Gee whiz, you guys. I'm very excited. I, I hope the, this goes well for you. I'm looking forward to, uh, to seeing it develop. Uh, this is going to be a great statement. Not only is it a statement of um, you know, renewable energy, it's a statement that uh, Hawaii has the, what do you want to call it, um, the moxie to do what they do in the North Sea, uh, to do what they do in so many other places in the world, that we can put deals like this together. It's a great statement, and I uh, wish you well on it. Uh, Thank you. Yes, we're, we're excited. And, um, you know, we're excited about Hawaii's leadership of putting in 100% RPS to, uh, to really drive this kind of innovation. Yeah. So, Chris, you want to make a final closing statement, or you want to leave that to Ted? Oh, well, you both want to make a final Ted. closing Go statement. <laughs> <laughs> uh, where you know, um, I like I like uh, Winston Churchill. Uh, he was very pithy, and he said, um, after I think it was after Dunkirk, he said, "This isn't the end. Um, it's not quite the beginning. It's more like the uh, end of the beginning." And so <laughs> we are really, um, I think, with with the Bowen process starting up, I think we're. We're at the end of the beginning, and so we've got a lot to do. Um, we, you know, site control and an off-taker are the two critical pieces, so that's where we're working on. And uh, we have a lot of do work to do with the community and understanding how to do this in as uh, least of an impactful way. And, um, but I, I agree with you, it is exciting. And I, I mean, if we built this wind farm on Oahu, it would go from the H1, H2 interchange to Mokalaia, okay? We just don't have the room on a walk. Yeah, right. So this is a great way to handle the fact of a limited uh, space on a limited island. Right. Um, so, Sharon, do you think it's okay if we ask them uh, for first rights to go out with our cameras <laughs> When they oh, start yeah, putting these fun. platforms you together, you know, gonna, oh, it'll be an exciting build. Process. We want to be there, That's man. True. You'll be able to be there. Yeah. <laughs> think that. That's yeah. fair. Yeah. That's fair. <laughs> okay, yeah. Sharon, close. Okay, I think this is exciting. We look at all kinds of um, variable resources and what can we do about it in storage. But if we don't start looking at what we have right in our backyard, like wind, and finding ways to do it, and it's exciting because we're on the way to doing that. Just that. So thank you, Ted. Thank you, Chris. We're on the wave. Ted Peck and Chris Swatley doing this fabulous project off Oahu. Love to see it happen. Here in Hawaii, the state of clean energy. Wind on the waves in Hawaii. Aloha. Aloha. Thanks for having us on the show.